I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 So here we are, second Sunday of Advent. The thing about the season of Advent is that it is over before you know it, and somehow we find ourselves right in the middle of things. I'm not entirely sure how that happened. Um, but if you, like me, are feeling a little bit bewildered, um, then maybe that's all right. Maybe that's part of how we are supposed to experience the season. So as we find ourselves in the, meaning, in the middle of the season of Advent, we also find ourselves in the middle of this series, dwelling in the presence of God. Um, those of you who were here last week will recall that we talked a little bit about preparation, what it means um, to really see the kingdom that is coming, and what it means for us this season of Advent to begin to prepare ourselves, our hearts, and our minds, our lives, individually and collectively, to really welcome the kingdom and the king. And so this week we will talk about where that preparation leads us um, towards something that we hear about as repentance in Matthew's Gospel this morning. And then next week all of this will come together as we talk about what it means to recognize Emmanuel, God with us. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Uh, repentance is a difficult concept. It's something that can make us feel very uncomfortable. Um, and so we've got lots sitting in front of us this morning. We're, we're first met with a stunning image from the prophet Isaiah, very much like last week, but maybe even more iconic. Who can't uh, help but fall in love with the image that Isaiah gives us of the lion and the lamb lying together? There's something incredibly alluring about predator and prey dwelling together in peace. It's a beautiful and almost unbelievable image. But the interesting thing about the reading from Isaiah is that it, it actually separates into two very even parts. The first part talks about who the king will be. And the second part talks about what the king's reign will look like. You need part one in order to be able to get to part two. And the thing that binds them together is this concept of the branch that will come out of the stump of Jesse. Did you catch that? All throughout this passage in Isaiah, there's this strange imagery dealing with what is actually a literal family tree this shoot that will grow out of the stump of Jesse. So it's worth mentioning that Jesse is the father of King David. And part of what's happening in, in Isaiah pointing back again and again to this family tree is he is recounting the history of Israel's salvation. So belong to this people of Israel is of great importance because at the root of Israel's story of salvation and of their understanding of who they are in relationship with God is this strange conviction that out of things that are very particular, things of universal significance can come. And so Abraham, who is a single man, is the recipient of this extraordinary promise from God that he will be the father of many peoples and nations and that through him, all nations will be blessed. That, that even though it's just this one person who exists at a particular time in history, somehow, through God, the significance of that man and his lineage will actually echo through eternity and affect all people across time. Foreshadowing, maybe, in some ways, the king who will come and exist for a moment in time, robed in human flesh, and will have significance for all people. This is kind of baked in to how Israel understands themselves and how they understand God's work in the world. But the family tree does more than that in the way that Isaiah talks about it. Jesse is the father of King David, but his father is Obed, and Obed's mother is Ruth. Ruth, for those of you who are familiar with the story, is an outsider. She's, she's from the land of Moab. And Moab is so, so much to be disregarded that in Scripture it tells us 
that no one from Moab shall be admitted to the assembly of Israel. And yet, in the face of tragedy and brokenness and bitterness, Ruth and her mother Naomi find themselves drawn into the love of God, taking risks and walking a new path. And as they work with God's plan, Ruth the outsider finds herself the consummate insider. She becomes the great-grandmother to King David. So Isaiah is pointing back to this extraordinary family history that tells us something about God's faithfulness and blessing through the ages, but also tells us something about what it means to be grafted into that family tree, where outsiders become insiders, where bitterness and sorrow is turned to joy and hope. And also, I think, tells us something about what happens when we change directions and learn to walk in the ways of God. Because Ruth finds herself at a crossroads. She's been told by her mother-in-law to go back to her homeland of Moab because there is no future for her anymore. And yet she chooses to follow her mother-in-law back to Israel, to a foreign land with a foreign God, with no real hope except for a commitment to family and a desire to take on this new God as her own. And through that walking in the path of God, Ruth finds extraordinary and unexpected blessing. Blessing which has significance not only for her and for her family, but for all people in all times. Through this particular person, something of universal significance takes place. And so Ruth... And this family tree that Isaiah is pointing us towards, they tell us something about what we are to make of this concept of repentance. The word repentance, as I said to the children this morning, has a bit of a funny connotation to it for us. Perhaps too often we have heard people with an angry voice and a harsh tone and often a bullhorn and a milk crate, people yelling, repent. And usually what they mean by that is, feel guilty. Repentance can become simply an individual exercise where we stop and we withdraw from the world around us. We turn inward and we tally up our faults. We take stock of the things that we have done wrong. We uh, tell ourselves to feel badly about those things. And then maybe we seek to make amends. Maybe we offer those things to God. And then we try to start again. But that is not what John the Baptist is calling us to. It's actually something much bigger. It's actually something that's even more demanding in a particular way. John confronts us with all the strangeness of the most unusual street creature in a cloak of camel's hair eating the food that he can forage in the wilderness. And we should, we should remember that John is the last great prophet of Israel. And just like the good prophets that have gone before him, he's not just speaking to individual people. He's speaking to the whole assembled people of Israel as a nation, as God's chosen people, as the people through whom the whole world will be blessed. And to this people, to us, John says, repent. Repentance here means turn. Return, perhaps. Stop going down the path on which you are headed and turn because something new is coming. John has the ability to see something that other people can't see. Even when he is in his mother's womb, John leaps at the presence of Jesus. He's able to see the coming kingdom. And so he kind of has one foot in both worlds. He's speaking to a people that aren't so sure of what is to come. But he's aware of the king who is coming. And so he calls people out of the center of power, out of the, the city centers, out of the places where you expect the action to be. He calls them into the wilderness, a place that Israel would recognize as a place of transition. And he bids people come and be baptized and repent and prepare because the kingdom is coming. So here, repentance means 
seeing the new thing that God is doing, and preparing ourselves so that we might be aligned with it. Repentance means recognizing the countercultural shift that John is calling us to, away from the centers of power and out into the margins, out into the wilderness, to see that the kingdom of God will not look like the kingdom of this world. And to take stock, because if we are living lives that align too closely with the kingdom of the world, when God's kingdom comes among us, we won't see it. We won't be aligned in the way that John invites us to be aligned. It's almost like John is saying, something big is coming, and if you don't train yourself to see it, you're in danger of missing it. Because the kingdom doesn't look like what everyone expects that it might look like. The kingdom is just a little bit different. And so, as we begin to venture out tentatively into the wilderness, as we hear these words that John tells us, we begin to remember the idea of preparation. We kind of layer them on top of each other. If preparation means making room, taking stock, trying to imagine ourselves living in line with the kingdom, then repentance means being willing to actually take hold of that new direction and actually take a positive step in a new way. A friend of mine um, recently adopted a three-year-old, and what he and his wife discovered was that preparation had an awful lot less to do with buying beds and clothes and making room in their house, and a lot more to do with learning how to live a new life. Because as soon as that child arrived in their lives and in their home, all of that preparation that they had done was good, but it didn't really cut it. What they discovered when this wonderful child was, was added to their lives, to their family, to their home, was that preparation only took them so far. They actually had to be willing to open themselves to all of the disruption, all of the joy, all of the newness that this person added to their lives. Things that they couldn't entirely anticipate. There's a way in which inviting a child into your lives like that is an incredibly brave thing to do because you become vulnerable. You become open to things that you can't possibly anticipate. You allow your life to be disrupted in the most extraordinary way. That, my friends, is what John calls us to as we prepare and as we repent. What would it mean if we open our lives up to receive the coming of Jesus as a child who comes into our lives with all of the disruption that that uh, assumes? What would happen if we re-examined our allegiances, the, the centers of existence that we have in our lives, be them social or economic or political, we re-examined all of those things and allowed them to be disrupted because the kingdom of God is indeed coming and it doesn't look like our economic system or our political system or our social systems. It looks like something different. It looks like the lion lying down with the lamb. And if we are to see the signs of that kingdom coming into our midst, then like Isaiah like Ruth, like all of the prophets that have come before, we are called to be vulnerable and open to something extraordinary that God is willing to do in our midst, if only we would turn and walk in the path that he has set before us. Disruption is the thing that is so difficult to accept. But it's not so much that feeling of guilt and self-examination. It's not that there's no part for that in repentance. It's just that it's bigger. It's the stuff of our lives. The question for us as we prepare to welcome the coming of the King, the one who is God made flesh, the God who is clothed in our own human frailty, the question for us is, are we truly prepared to change our lives to welcome that child? said repentance might actually be even harder than that guilty feeling that we get when we hear street preachers. This is why, my friends, as we prepare for the coming of Emmanuel, 
John and Isaiah and the whole tradition of Israel urges us to perk up our heads and begin to train ourselves to see that the kingdom is coming and it looks like something different than what the world around us tells us. So my friends, on this second Sunday of Advent, may we hear John's call to repentance. May we take to heart the vision that Isaiah promises, the beautiful image of the lion laying down with the lamb, and may we know that it is through the actions of particular people through history that the incredible things of universal significance take place. And then may we lean into that tradition ourselves, in our own lives, in our own time, as a church, as a people, beginning to align ourselves with the great kingdom of God, which is coming. May we prepare and make, make the paths straight. Thanks be to God.